Father God, we thank you that uh, as we gather tonight, we trust that you will impart something for each one of us. We thank you for the expertise that we have here. We thank you for the, ex the, uh, the openness and the interest that we have here. And we thank you, God, that in each of our different situations, uh, you are the one who provides. You are the one who calls. You are the one who enables. And so uh, give us just a, 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 a bigger and a better, wider uh, and a more faith-filled perspective on leadership and where leadership comes from and how leaders uh, come into being in our churches. And my prayer right at the beginning of this night is in each of our situations, you will call people, you will enable people to grow into leadership and take on leadership and, and flourish for the sake of not just our churches, but your kingdom in all the places where we are. So we offer this evening to you and invite you, Lord, to speak to us through each of our contributors. Amen. So, Ian, thank you very much. And we'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, am I able to share my screen? Am I? Uh, can you make me a co-host or something like that? I'll just need to make you co-host, Ian. So just... it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And there's always learning in the room. You know, I'm, I'm probably not going to say anything that you, have, you don't know already. Um, but I think my purpose is, is just to stir those, those thoughts up and to encourage you and to strengthen you so you can step forward um, in, into new things. So I'll share my screen and we'll just have a few thoughts. Paul, do you want me to finish at the same time? So Well, we started a, uh, a little bit late with you, so, so I'm sure you can overrun a little bit and we can, we can make it okay. up. Okay, just wave at me when I... Yeah, I'll, I'll interrupt when I'm getting bored. Oh, yeah, excellent. Well, that'll... <laughs> I'll mute myself now anyway. Okay. Um, so let's, let's go with this then. So I hope, um, I think we all know, don't we, that for us to lead well, we're going to have to release and nurture other leaders around us. You know, it's, it's like parenting. You know, the goal of parenting is not children. The whole point of being a father and a mother is, is not children, it's to produce fathers and mothers. You know, children are just the necessary beginning. And it's the same with leaders. The goal of being a leader is not followers. The goal of being a leader is to produce more leaders. And I just want to share a few thoughts around that whole idea. And I want to talk just briefly about the way you lead. Um, and I realise that we're all in sort of slightly different leadership roles, but the fact that you're here means you're, you are taking responsibility and shaping the life of the community along with others. Um, and the way that you do that, whatever role you're in, um, does, a, does affect how others flourish. And I, I think we need to lead in ways that enable others to flourish around us. Uh, but it's much bigger than that because the church community is also a culture which can or cannot encourage people to lead. And what, what we want is to have a culture that encourages people to step forward into leadership and to flourish. And then, you know, if we do get a bit of time, we might ask the question, what, what are we looking for in emerging leaders? What, what are the things that we need to, to, to watch for? So how can, how can I lead in a way that causes others to want to lead and others to flourish. And this is the first thing I'd say, that you lead strongly and clearly. Um, you know, sometimes out of our desire to release people, we can think, well, we need to hold back a bit on our leadership. And actually it's the other way around. But when we're leading strongly and clearly, and I don't mean, you know, authoritarianly, I mean collaboratively and building teams and, and all that kind of thing, but when we're, when we're leading strongly and clearly, other people flourish and will step into leadership as well. If we don't do that, it can create anxiety. It can leave a bit of a vacuum. There can become sort of competing power groups in the community. And in that kind of context, people who are thinking about leading more sort of hold back a little bit. But when they see you leading strongly and clearly, they'll step forward. Secondly, you enjoy leading. Um, you know, if you're, if we're always sort of stressed and under pressure, you know, who else will want to lead? Or if we're just rushed and busy, and we don't have time or space for people, you know, who's going to step 
towards us there's there isn't enough space for them to step towards us or if we're always you know complaining about how difficult it is being a leader you know who's going to want to be one so it's a real necessity for us to enjoy the role that God has called us into and and that we're flourishing in it too I think thirdly that we are pursuing personal growth you know whatever whatever your gifts are keep developing them that's what I you know encourage you to you know whether that's books you're reading or conferences you go to or evenings like this or you know people you ring up and and go and spend time with you know keep growing yourself you know if you're a teacher keep learning theology keep reading the bible keep thinking you know if, if you're an evangelist keep running missions or running alpha courses or christianity explored and you know, if you're a more prophetic type person, keep praying and spending time with God and listening to God and going on retreats, all that kind of thing. Whatever your gifts are, you know, if you're more administrative, then, you know, research the latest software that helps us keep things running well or go on an advanced Excel course, you know, whatever it is, a church suite course. When people see you growing as a person and that you love the way that God's made you, and that you're pursuing your calling and developing yourself, other leaders will gather to you. They'll say, actually, this is somebody I want to be with. This is somebody I want to serve with. And then uh, finally, have a high level of personal security. You know, it is a sad fact in church life that some highly gifted leaders are also quite insecure. And insecure leaders are threatened by other leaders so they don't allow others to flourish around them or they kind of hold on to the strings of authority and power and decision making they don't let other people take hold of that and start to shape things with them and um, you know true leaders want to have true responsibility they want to shape things and develop things and change things they don't want to just do tasks they've been told to do um, so what we need to do as leaders in order to develop new leadership is surround ourselves with people who want to be like that and that means we need to be willing to sort of be secure ourselves and start to create an environment around us where it's safe to lead with us so that's just a few thoughts about us how we are in god and how we lead will determine whether people can flourish and step into leadership near to us then thinking about the second thing you know the culture in the church you know culture is the way things are that often they don't have to be said they're just kind of this is the way things are around here and it's usually new people or those outside the church who can see it the clearest you know everyone who is part of the church almost takes it for granted so just a few thoughts about that what kind of culture do we need to create one is a cultural responsibility that um, that people feel the way to the church's purpose, that people instinctively kind of think, well, um, I need to do these things. You know, what, whatever your purpose is as a church and however you sort of shape that and share that with people, that, that they immediately start to think, I need to step forward into that. You know, people can think that, being part of a church means they're a consumer of religious services. You know, they consume the worship or the teaching or the pastoring or the evangelism. You know, it's always somebody else's job to do whatever it is the church exists to do. And, and, and often their language gives them the way. They start to talk about, when will the church do this? Instead of saying, you know, when am I going to do this? And actually creating this culture of, of mutual responsibility in the whole community is a space where leaders start to emerge secondly serving you know and this is where people want to help if they possibly can you know, they often don't need to be asked they just offer to help and this is something that has to be taught and modeled it's not natural in our culture um you know we 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 we, we often li kind of live in the place where we expect other people to one of the saddest things i ever encountered in our church was um the amount of kind of litter people live behind on sunday morning you know crisp packets and half-eaten biscuits and water bottles and i thought 
you would never do that if that was your living room. You'd never kind of leave your living room. And I think this space is like our living room. Uh, it's not somewhere you come and you kind of like the cinema and then you just leave. And it's 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 engendering a culture where people instinctively think, oh, we ne I need to tidy up now, that sort of thing. Boundaries is another very, very important issue if people are going to step into leadership. Life is very demanding, it's busy, lots of expectations. And it's actually right and important that people have a balanced and sustained life. You know, one of the problems churches have is they overwork people and overworking creates resistance to serving. You know, when we ask people to take on responsibility, we owe it to them to be really clear that this is how much time it's going to take. This is the energy it will take. And these are the skills that are needed. And it has to be OK in the culture that it. I can serve for a season and then have and then have rest. It's good to say no. And it's right that people can balance their lives. So there's time for family and recreation and for God. You know, the load must not be too great. And it's our responsibility as leaders to create that sort of culture. Where there's clear boundary for people to, to lead a life that, you know, all the bits of their life can work well with all the other bits. And of course, that means creating a culture of team, you know, team at every level. No one does anything on their own. Everything is done in teams. Um, and obviously, you know, teams have leaders, which means you can create opportunity for people to start leading in kind of sort of small, discreet ways. Um, and the team leader's job is often just to make sure the team works well. But no one works on their own. You know, if you're on, uh, there might be in some teams you do quite a lot of things kind of on your own but you, there's never a sense of I'm on my own in this uh, there's a really big difference between doing some work on your own and being on your own and then appreciation everyone's encouraged all the time you cannot overdo this you know for years we would have a kind of a thank you evening for all our leaders we would give them a meal I would make a speech and, um, you know, sometimes we thank people when they stop, don't we? And we give them a little present or something and recognition. We try to do that when they were still going. Um, and whatever it takes to appreciate somebody, some people, that kind of appreciation, they like it done personally rather than a public thing. And so it does take a bit of time. But people who are serving and leading need to know they've been seeing their efforts have been appreciated. And that's a whole culture of kind of thank you, we love you, this is great, you're doing brilliantly, all that. And then linking to the boundaries thing, clarity. Um, I think I learned this a bit late in my leadership. I assumed far too much. I assumed that everybody else knew how to do things. And we had to learn how to write good role descriptions and make it really, really clear to people, this is what we want you to do, this is, this, these are the outcomes that will mean you've done it really well. This is all, these are the relationships you need to have with other leaders, you know, like finance or booking building space, all that kind of stuff. So people really, really know what it is they're taking on. And they're much more likely to step into that leadership space if they have that. So then final thoughts. Um, who are we looking for? You know, what are we looking for when we're looking for new leaders? Um, what sort of things are we looking for? Well, here's a few thoughts on that. We're looking at everybody. Look at everybody. <laughs> Don't discount people too quickly. Um, you know, we're looking for women and men. We're looking for old and young. You know, there's a whole group of people who perhaps, you know, are financially secure, retired early, got lots of energy, you know, they're not young, but they've got lots to give. We're looking for those people who are new in the church, you know, and those people who've been in the church for decades. You're looking for people who are perhaps more visible, more high profile in the way they present themselves and the quiet, shy people who stay in the background. Um, you know, try and be try and be blind to any sense of distinction. Don't don't look at people who are just like you. Try and think of everybody and keep your eyes on 
everybody. You, you never know the moment when God starts to work in somebody's life and they start to really want to step forward to serve and to lead and to take responsibility and to use their gifts to bless others. But you are looking for some things. Alignment is, is what we're looking for. And firstly, to values. You know, if you have, say you have a value of grace in your church, that pe people know that God loves them and affirms them and receives them and welcomes them. You know, if, if you're trying to raise somebody up and they're actually a bit condemning or a bit critical or a bit driven or a bit dominating, then they will struggle to lead in the church community because the way they behave doesn't align with the, the values that they're in the church. So values are absolutely critical. I mean, but alignment to purpose as well. You know, if your purpose is to, to enjoy God and to bring God into everything and to pray, um, then somebody who you ask to lead who never prays or doesn't participate in worship or doesn't, you know, doesn't really bring scripture into things, they're going to struggle again with their leadership. And then thirdly, to vision, you know, it, 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 it's not the top thing. Values is definitely the top thing, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, if your vision is to, is, to, is to grow the church, but somebody you're trying to, to, to ask to step into leadership never welcomes a new person or only ever talks to the friendship group, you know, that's going to create problems as well. So alignment to those kind of key things. Then obviously willingness to serve willingness to serve you know i in developing new people i often ask them to do you know quite low low profile things first uh just to see how they got on and to see if they were willing to serve or whether they were looking for something else you know some other kind of recognition or something um our church when when i stopped leading it we had an executive pastor when he arrived at the church i knew he was a leader uh, I asked them to lead our stewards team. And they're absolutely vital to our safety on Sunday, but no one ever noticed them. But he loved it, and he did a really, really good job. And and now he's got you know massively responsible role in the church. And of course, there's character. You know, this is a complicated area. We're all a work in progress, but actually, character is all important in leadership. And there's lots of scripture behind that is you know jesus you know it's what comes out of a person that actually ruins us and, and and defiles us and we need to to start to develop people we need to know them well enough to know that actually you know no one's perfect we're all working on the stuff but that some things have been sorted out and people have a commitment a heart commitment to christ-like character then of course relationships you know churches is, is people being built together in relationships of love that's how it works and leaders don't have to be extroverts or party animals you know some of the most effective leaders i know are quite quite shy people but to lead in church you've you've got to know that people can relate well to other people and can get on with people and love being in team and, and love being collaborative in in the way they work and and you know have a warmth and an appreciation and a love for people and then of course skills and gifts i'm always on the lookout for people who've got skills and gifts i'm trying to spot that um, in the way they behave and in, in in the way they conduct themselves i'm trying to see it in the small things and say oh can i can i create a, an opportunity for that person to maybe show me They've got more in that area. Uh, this is the lady called Anne. Um, she leads a team in our in our church, uh, the prophetic team, which is basically about helping the whole church kind of hear God and, and relate well to God and be close to God. And um, I worked with her over a two year period to develop that team. But, you know, it was it was spotting the, the germ of that in her that really got us going into that. You know, if you want someone to teach, make sure they can teach. You know, if, if you want someone to administrate, make sure that they, they've got some gifts in that area uh, and can communicate well and, to, and can build teams and all that kind of stuff. Uh, 
So it's those are the kind of things that you're looking for. Um, but another piece in the puzzle, which I just want to leave you with, it, is this, that I think sometimes it's just about gut feel and discernment. You know, I, as a, as a leader in the church, you get to know people, you get to see people, you get to connect with people a lot. And I was always on the lookout for those moments where God would give me a nudge and say, get to know that person a bit more, find out where they're coming from, find out what their heart is, see if you can't create a, an opportunity for them to develop and to grow and to take responsibility. And that kind of, is, I think it's a gift of discernment. And I think that's a vital role in a leader that you, you can see who's there, you can see something that's in them and you can start to uh, connect to them and release them and empower them. So, thank you. Those are those are my thoughts. Opportunity now for a, a bit of Q and A, particularly with Ian, and we'll have another opportunity later on with um, uh, with Glenn and Nick as well, or maybe just to feed back some some thoughts and uh, your own experiences. But out of that discussion that you've had in the breakout rooms, does anybody want to? Um, bring a question or a comment uh, and, and we'll put Ian on the spot. Make, make sure they're difficult. We want to put him on the spot and give him a hard time tonight, you know. Let him, let him earn his uh, place in our meeting. Shall I kick us off? Because I've got one, one Ian. And, and um, I guess, forgive me if I, 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 I got this wrong, but I, I got the impression, as you're, you're talking about leadership from your context, uh, your church as it is now is, is quite a large church, certainly by our standards. Um, and do these principles apply just as much when you were the six people or how many you were when you started? Uh, and if, if there's any difference, what would the difference be between a small setting um, and, and, and a large church setting? For example, the team in, in a small church setting, you are the team, the whole church, basically, aren't you? Uh, and, and, uh, and, it, and it maybe works very differently from... Uh, the way teams operate in a large setting. Any, any thoughts on, on that one, Ian? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so we started with six people working on a council estate in Biker. Um, so, you know, significantly under-resourced community with quite a strong vision to reach that community. I, I can't think of anything I that had to significantly change in terms of leadership development from when we were six to when we were, you know, several hundred. I think this, this is, I think I sort of did all the same sorts of things. Now, you have to, you have to scale that up because obviously when you're a larger community, you can't just be one person who's doing leadership development. Lots of people have got to be doing that. But creating that sort of environment where I, I'm enjoying that God's called me to lead. I want you to sense God's calling you to lead. I want you to enjoy that process as well. I'm going to invite you to step into that space. I want to create a, a culture where we, we all sort of flourish in that. And that's, we feel like this is a great way to live rather than just sort of an extra burden and a busy life. I think we were doing that right from the beginning. Um, and the way we kind of did it changed, you know, the sort of the methodology and the, you know, so leadership development when you're small is basically, was basically me having a coffee or a beer or a lunch, you know, or a walk with people. <laughs> it was quite informal. As, as it grew, it became more formal. And there were there was a course to go on or lessons to 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 go on, you know, all that kind of stuff. So the strategic steps changed, but I think the heart of of it didn't never change. And I think I kind of go back to when I was like 14. When I was 14, at my school, everybody played cricket in the summer term. And the people who were terrible at cricket and couldn't be in any of the school teams. And there were loads of school teams. It was really weird. 
we played a thing called Meadow League. So it was, these were the people like me who just were hopeless and couldn't get in the team. And we had to play each other in, in you know, all the different houses in the school had to play each other. Everyone was bored, everyone was frustrated. Nobody kind of enjoyed it. Nobody committed to it. We all tried to slope off home early. And I thought, you know, when I get to be captain, and I thought when I'm sort of 14, I'll be captain of this terrible thing. I'm gonna change this. And that's exactly what happened. I managed, you know, we, we were hopeless at cricket, but I thought we can at least have a good afternoon together. And we enjoyed ourselves so much, we started to win all our games. And then the other teams kind of came in behind it. And it became, for, for one season, it became incredibly competitive. And it was beautiful. It was like a storybook. It came down to the final match, just to who won the Meadow League. And we won. And our house master took us all up to the school uh, canteen and gave us a Mars bar. You know, it was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> And I think that kind of, it's that kind of heart. Do you know what I mean? I don't think there's any sort of, it's not having all the right processes. It's having the right heart. And I think having that heart sort of works however big you are and whether you're in, you know, a big city centre or a small council estate like we were on, it's just the same. Um, I don't know if that helps you or not, but that's how it feels. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to uh, make a point or ask a question? Amazing. It's all going very quiet here. Yeah. Well, I'll ask another one in that case. I'm going <laughs> to. Oh, Glenn, over to you. Hey, Ian, thanks. Uh, your talk was really helpful. Um, lots, of, lots of wisdom there over many years, obviously. Can you maybe talk a bit more about boundaries and how you do that for your church and, and how you demonstrate it in, in your own life? Yes. So I think it's about how, and I think this is really, really, really important, particularly for the sort of under 40s. They want to have a good family life. They don't want to just give everything either to their work or to their church. And I think there's quite a lot of, you know, wisdom in that actually. Um, so we tried to make sure that um, we got good time off, you know, people, you know, those who were on the staff, for example, of the church or were, when we had a staff, we didn't overwork them. Um, we tried to make every role manageable so it could be delivered in, in the capacity that we were asking people to have, you know, whether that was a volunteer role or a, an employed role or whatever, that, that it was always doable. We, 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 and we could kind of account for that as well. We could measure that and explain that to people and say, well, it's going to be so many evenings in the month or it's going to be so many hours or, you know, whatever, or so many responsibilities that you'll need to fulfill. We tried to make sure that um, people had complete freedom to kind of set the boundaries of their life and that we weren't pressurizing them. Um, so when people said, you know, I need to stop doing this now, they got a good answer from us. They didn't get a kind of a, a kind of sad look or you know a funny glance but we we applauded people when they wanted to step back or needed to for family circumstance um, and we tried to create a sort of culture where no one was kind of indispensable that it was absolutely fine maybe you'd let the kids work for 10 years but you could stop you know because somebody else could do it and we could find somebody. We, we kind of had faith, I think, that we could always find somebody. Um, and I think if you've got momentum all the time towards people wanting to serve, then you can always ask people to step a little bit further up. Um, and so, you know, in terms of energy, time, um, having breaks, you know, we tried to create teams so that you didn't have to do it every week. You didn't have to do it all year you know whether that's worship or kids work or um alpha or you know whatever that you could have a bit you could have a break 
<laughs> you know, watch the telly or something. Um, and I think when you've got those kind of clear boundaries, I felt much more confident with actually giving a strong invitation to people and saying, come on, you know, this kingdom of God stuff really matters. Because I knew I was inviting them into a space that, that, that was respectful towards family life and work life and rest life, you know. And we did try to model that ourselves, you know. So my, my time off as the, the, the lead elder, you know, I had, a I had a fixed day off, I had a clear day off. Oh, you would never see me or hear from me. If you tried to contact me, it was, you know, hopeless. Um, I had evenings off. You know, I had a life outside of church. I enjoyed my, myself doing other things as well. And we kind of tried to model that to people so that they knew they could be like that too. I don't know if that answers the question. So I feel a bit rambly then. No, it's really helpful. Do you think there's a coming out the back of the past year and a half, there's lessons to be learned in terms of simplifying church? Yeah, we were, we were talking about that in our little group. We think we've created too much activity and particularly too much building centric activity. If you've got a church building, the, the, the kind of feeling is, well, you must have stuff on in the building. And, um, and you just don't, you know. So we, there were several things we did that were very successful that we just stopped doing altogether. Cause we just, if you, we took the decision, if you haven't got a team to lead it and run it well, then we're not, we're just not going to do it. You know, things like kids clubs, um, toddler groups, um, you know, missional stuff like Alpha. If we couldn't sustain it, we wouldn't do it. And so sometimes if you're very activity orientated, you're just constantly trying to recruit people into roles. We took it, we tried to do it the other way around. We tried to recruit people into what God was gifting them to mm. do and then find a space where that would work. Yeah and not being too precious about our programs. I mean, obviously some things need to happen. Like it's quite good to meet for worship and teaching the community <laughs> on a Sunday, you know, so there kind of, there's a minimum set of criteria that we tried to, but even things like small groups, you know, if, if we didn't have the leaders for small groups, then we had the leaders we had and we didn't try and have any more, you know, and that was that. So yes, I think simplifying and pruning is a great. Yeah, we tend to have a drive towards setting things up. I think we should have equal clarity about stopping things. And I regret the times when we didn't do that well enough. Which doesn't require a virus every time that we need to stop things. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's been useful though, on the one level. Thank, thanks, Glenn, and thank, thank, thanks, Eve. Maybe time for one more question, if anybody else would like to uh, ask another question at this point. Before we go for a break. I'll give you one more then, Ian, just, and, and we'll, we'll try and make it a quick one, but um, uh, I, I know somebody very well who, who's training for ministry, and... Um, uh, in, in, in the church where this person is uh, um, uh, learning more about uh, church-based ministry, one of the challenges that this church is facing is, is a reluctance of people to step forward into leadership. That whenever people are asked and where opportunities are given, uh, nobody is forthcoming, it seems. Uh, it's this kind of negative culture. Um, anything that you might say around that kind of issue? And then I can... Uh, Feedback to this person that, that they're, they're <laughs> in the meeting tonight. That's, I think, a very real and a very significant problem. I think the first thing I'd want to, to try and find out is why has that been, why has that grown up? So that hasn't come out of nowhere. That's come out of experience of, uh, of some kind and leadership of some kind that has engendered as a, an unwillingness. And I think sometimes it's helpful to try and unpick some of the roots of that. Is try and try and understand that, and try and call that out and name it, and say, "Look, this is a this is a kind of a thing in our church community 
let's explore that. Let's find out why we are like that. And then, then we have something to go on, don't we? We can start to address it. Is that, did we burn people out? Did we, did we lack boundaries? Did we uh, try and do too many things? Did we not support people enough in, in their roles? Uh, so they felt they were like kind of floundering out of their depth and they're just not gonna go there again. Did we give people enough training so they felt confident that they were doing the right things and doing them well? You know, there's all kinds of reasons why that might have happened. When people needed to stop, was that okay? Did they feel happy? Did they were they thanked or were they sort of frowned at for stopping? You know, this I I until you kind of explore the sort of cultural context that's given rise to that reluctance, it's difficult to know what the solution is. But then I think once you've kind of called it out and named it, uh, you can start to address specific reasons. But also it, it comes back down to the same things again. Do people are people do people love the Lord and feel excited about Jesus? Does that do their spiritual lives need refreshing? Um, so kind of something before the leadership piece is the spiritual connection to God piece. Um, do they need re-envisioning about reaching their community and, 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 and mission? Is that, is that being lost through disappointment or difficulty or obstacle of some kind? You know, so a re-envisioning, reinvigorating of people's walk with God and people's sense of vision can, can start to, to change the culture and change the, the feel. There's, that's just a few random thoughts, Paul. You can pass that on to the person who rem shall remain nameless. <laughs> Thank you very much. So thanks, Nick Allen from The Well, uh, for joining us. And uh, we'll hand over to you to tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, training people, uh, particularly through the Deeper Discipleship School. Thank you. Uh, Paul, if you could just uh, enable screen share, that would be great. I'll, I've got one or two bits to show. Well, um, I've been learning a lot listening to Ian and to your comments, everybody. Um, so uh, it says on my sheet that uh, it, to talk about the, uh, something to do with the value of internships uh, uh, and um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the particular one that we have. But I think in terms of raising leaders at the, at the well, um, I would say uh, there's something about making the ask on people, not being afraid to ask people to step into roles and to leadership um, and even high capacity people. Uh, you know, the, the reason they're, that they're high capacity for a reason. And so actually most of the high capacity people I've ever approached um, tend, to, tend to thank you rather than want to push you away if you're approaching them to do more. Um, I had a conversation today with a, a lady who has a full-time job, has her own consultancy business, is raising two children and whose husband works kind of 60 hour weeks, I think, um, and I asked her to become one of our trustees and she said she was honoured and she would go away and carefully consider it. And it genuinely wasn't what I was expecting her to say, uh, but I think I painted a picture of why. And, and so when we make the ask on people, it's really important to paint, to, to share the why, um, which for, for us is about the kingdom of God before it's ever about church, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, because people will, you know, they, we we on this screen are given our lives for the, the kingdom of God. Um, people will sacrifice all sorts of things for Jesus, um, much more so than they will for church. Uh, and so we, we, you know, we're careful to say that actually the, our church exists for the sake of the lost, as well as for the people who are in it. And, and to continually share a vision as to why we're a community of faith, where we think we're going and what we can achieve under God, who we are in God. Um, so there's a lot about, I, I suppose you kind of do some pre-work about motivation for people, um, which tends, in my experience, tends to help them to, to say yes when you ask them something significant. Uh, the other thing we work hard on is, is that uh, we try and make every, every ministry missional. Every ministry missional. Uh, it's quite a challenge to make sure that we're not doing something that doesn't either bring us closer to the lost or bring the lost closer to Jesus. But um, we were determined when we began the church that we wouldn't just do stuff for the sake of it, if you say to me. 
uh, and we wouldn't have meetings for meetings sake and, and, and so on, but that every time we met, there would be somehow we would be open to either bringing the message of Jesus to the lost or bringing the lost closer to, to church. And, to, uh, and that I think is a really good motivation for leaders as well. And, and even if it's the coffee rotor on a Sunday morning, that actually is that because you are welcoming, you're creating hospitality, a place of welcome, you know, and, and integration to a body of Christ. So again, I think it's, I think that the way that we present this exciting kingdom life it is partly how you can help to empower and to uh, motivate leaders. Um, the, uh, the, the, I, I did an internship uh, of sorts when I was about 24 or something like that. Um, and maybe some of you guys did here. It, it certainly changed the trajectory of my Christian walk. Um, here's what I valued from it, being alongside other leaders. Uh, watching their lives up close uh, and personal, being involved, being invited to have a go. Uh, you know, we talked about, um, is it too early to, to release leaders in our in our small group that I was in? Uh, and uh, I don't think it is usually. Uh, Jesus recruited incompetent young men to lead his movements, didn't he? And whipped them into shape along the way. Uh, and that was pretty much what I was. Um, but I was believed in, people believed in me invested their time and energy in me and their hospitality and shared their life with me as well as information um, and it began to empower me to realize that I can not only can I lead the kingdom life for myself but I can lead others towards it as a leader as well so um, you know the whole for me the, the value of an internship and it, it, this may be a, a kind of fixed program that you can begin in a church or it could just be an informal arrangement where you just say to well, it's a minimum of one other person, isn't it? Uh, let's go on a journey together uh, of learning to lead and, and, and release you into more opportunity. Um, uh, if, if it's done on a, an apprenticeship model, I think it's really powerful. So uh, internships are not about free labour for the local church. They're not about a cheap way to get a youth worker or a, a family's worker or whatever. Um, that's a terrible motivation. Uh, but they, if you if you uh, paint your an internship opportunity as uh, an apprenticeship to not just to Jesus but to someone who's gone there a bit further ahead, then that's the way that Jesus led, isn't it? Uh, he just said, "Come follow me." Uh, it's also a great way. We've talked about teams this evening. It's a great way to kickstart teams. I, I absolutely, fundamentally believe that you shouldn't do things alone in in church life, and church leaders should not be lone ministers. They should always be in teams. I just just it's wise it's biblical it's you know it spreads the load jesus when he went out as far as i can see he never sent out anybody in ones he sent them out in a minimum of two um, and so actually having some kind of internship begins to build that sense of team uh, and if 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 you guys are in a, a very small setting of, of maybe one minister already you've doubled your your team by having an internship uh, and so there's a tremendous sense of community that comes um, so it kickstarts team, it kickstarts passionate faith in people having an internship because they see they're forced, uh, not forced, required to step out in faith, perhaps outside of their comfort zones. Um, and, and that usually works because God is real and the Holy Spirit is powerful. And so people discover, ah, I can do more than I thought. God is bigger than I realized. Uh, and so you're kickstarting a, a kind of a passion. And again, some of, some of you guys were talking about um, how do you recruit in a situation where people are a bit nervous of leadership? And uh, um, it only takes one or two people to, to get excited. Um, and internships really help with that to begin to change the culture. So that's my preamble. I'll, I'll just tell you about deeper, um, briefly how it works for us. We, we, have a, we decided, we planted the church in 2015 and we decided to try and open an, an internship program as soon as possible. So it took us one year. We, we spent money on it, we, um, we uh, underwrote the course uh, and it cost us thou several thousands of pounds over the years to do that, but we totally believe in it. Um, it kind of breaks even these days. Um, uh, so I'll just sh I'm just gonna sh show you a, a quick slide. Um, it, it may be that in your church, uh, this is an appropriate juncture for you to think about uh, whether you run deeper or uh, perhaps what Glenn is gonna share or whatever. 
uh, but um, just at the moment, we're, we're, we're talking about the possibility of um, the course that we run actually happening in other churches uh, with local with, with a local church being a hub that receives information, uh, uh, kind of core content uh, from us on video, uh, training, teaching material, uh, and then lives out in the local context, um, being an intern, I suppose, and being a disciple of Jesus. So we thought really carefully about if you're going to have any kind of program where you try and raise leaders intentionally, and this incidentally has nothing to do with the age. Uh, we've had people who've done deeper our course um, from age 18 until age 70 and everything in between. We've had everything from asylum seekers um, and uh, unemployed people and students to uh, several hospital consultants have done the course alongside us and um, um, entrepreneurs who've sold their businesses for lots of money. Uh, because it's about being hungry for going deeper in God. It's not about anything else. And so I want to encourage you that you, you, you know, you can start internships with people at, at any age if they are hungry for, for growth. Uh, deeper itself uh, it, it, it is deliberately um, built around a, a three-thirds model where we will give people teaching and discipleship input, you know, train them about the Bible and uh, aspects of the faith. Um, and what it is to how to navigate everyday life as a as a sold out follower of Jesus, but that's about a third of the input. One third of the input is is worship and prayer time, uh, building our devotional lives, uh, and one third is actually looking beyond ourselves. And and again, actually, this might be a good model for any local church. Um, but we 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 try and help people in this program to um, learn how to share their faith. Uh, or, or share the blessing of God. So sometimes we'll send them out onto the streets, which terrifies most people. Uh, we, we happen to be in the city centre in Sheffield, near, near the city centre, but so there's a lot of people around. Um, but you know, we'll try and uh, find, uh, if, see if somebody just, even just to bless people and say, "Can I pray for you today? What's going on for you?" Or this week, we've been in our local businesses, just popping into the cafes and saying, "Hey." We're here to bless you. Would you let us pray for your cafe and business? And it's very rare that somebody says no to that. So just teaching people to, uh, it, it gets rid of fear, fear of other people, um, and, conf and it builds confidence in the gospel. And so we do that for, for one third of our time as well. And we find projects as well. So um, over the years, people have, uh, we've served another, another local church in Sheffield, which had a project with the Roma people. And we sent people there uh, for an afternoon a week just to serve them, get stuck in, um, learn how to serve the poor in, in real life, uh, you know, in practical ways. Um, we've we've prayed with other churches in their locations for an hour or two a week. It's 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 um yeah there you go. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly how deeper works. It's, you, you may or may not wish to pick this up with me afterwards, but um, uh, we are able to offer um, the deeper school of ministry, which we've now run for five years. Um, as uh, as a kind of a package now. Um, uh, so from, from Sheffield, where I am, we, we have a core curriculum, uh, of uh, a curriculum of Christ-likeness, I hope. Uh, and we would also support uh, hubs around the, uh, the region um, in terms of how they set themselves up uh, with a kind of regular processing and, and, and central support. Um, uh, we also, in common with many internships, uh, people go try. We try and do an overseas uh, mission trip. That may not be possible with lockdown, but certainly something that pushes people's uh, pushes people outside of their comfort zone. It could be that we actually come to you and, and, and help uh, evangelism and mission in your area for a week or so. Um, but it's just something getting people out of their comfort zone, which is amazing. Uh, and then uh, local hubs uh, for, the, for the deeper school of ministry um, have, uh, would provide one person to become the kind of mentor of whoever signs up to this this program I'm, I'm, I'm not really calling it an internship because it's not really that it's really a discipleship program although it can be it can sit alongside people who want to get better at church ministry as it were uh, and then you can see the other things that that kind of a local hub would would need to provide them local in your context if, if if you took the curriculum that deeper has you 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 could also provide places for prayer and worship uh, and ways to to reach out beyond them beyond ourselves uh like going out on the streets or sharing the gospel or, or serving a local project um, and and then pastorally walking with the students and as i say when we started deeper we started with um, just seven people the first year um 
uh, we've had a few more, we've had a few less. I think this year we haven't had very many more than that because of lockdown and it's all been on, a lot of it's been on Zoom, but it's been fantastic. So um, the last thing I wanted to do is just show you a two minute testimony from a girl called Latifa. Uh, Latifa came to us, uh, she's kind of in her mid, early early 20s from the kind of West Yorkshire area um, in, a, in a pretty broken state. But I want to encourage you that um, she happens to be young, but it could, this could be anyone. This could be the 70 year old Lynn uh, who came to us as well, that investing in people, going on a journey with them in an internship will produce dividends it is costly to the local church because you have to put resource and time and effort into it dedicated resource or you know to you don't apprentice people by accident you, you apprentice people deliberately walking alongside them into whatever skill it is and, and whatever character is that you think that they need um, but uh, the, the since doing uh, deeper with us Latifa actually did an did a, an internship in worship with us for a year after doing a, a regular kind of discipleship school and then she came on staff as our youth minister for two years uh, so I want but I wanted just to share her story if that's all right Paul for two more minutes is that right yes thumbs up great okay so uh, hopefully this will, will work and you'll be able to hear what Latifa has to say and also it will give you a little feel for the context of where we are in Sheffield. A year ago I was really in a, in a bad place. Uh, I was suffering mental health stuff, substance abuse stuff, uh, and I just really had no hope. I had a false hope, I think, and I was going through on places and you know, so if I would talk to myself then as me now, first of all, me then wouldn't have believed me now. Like just doing what we did today, standing up and leading in the service, it was just so far beyond anything I thought I could ever do. Um, but I think the main thing I would say is that it's, it's it's quite it's really hard and challenging, but it's worth it. And I don't think anything worth having it comes easy. Um, I would question anything that comes that easy. Yeah, it's hard work and it's a journey. Um, and just stick with it. And I would say just give 100%. I think you get as much out of these types of things as you put in. Um, so just go in, like, do everything. Go in the streets, talk to the people, pray the prayers, say what you think God's saying to you, you know, pay for healing, do all that. Um, because then, you know, you just get to reap the reward in return because just God in his nature is just gracious and generous. So, yeah, I'd say go for it 100%. I think the penny probably dropped for me kind of around the father heart time. My perception of God as a father was just way off base, uh, but I don't think I realised that. And we spent the weekend doing the father heart stuff and honestly I was sat in those meetings and sat in those seminars and I was like we need to get everyone here I know in here right now <laughs> to hear this stuff like this stuff is like life-changing but it's so simple and I don't understand like why I didn't see it before um but as soon as I kind of knew and understood <laughs> the truth of being a child of God and what that means that's when I was like all right I get it Let's make this happen. Um, you know, and it was challenging before then and it's been challenging afterwards, but that's certainly in my head the moment where I was like, I'm in the right place. Who's very broken and God just really got hold of. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's me done, Paul. I'll, I'll, I'll let Glenn pick it up and I'll talk to you in a bit. Thank you, Nick. And, and just to say, if, if any of you want to ask Nick questions about some of the practicalities of Deeper, maybe you can just use the chat function. Uh, make make it a, a question that we can all see. So because otherwise, because uh, your question may be a question that somebody else is asking, maybe Nick, you can just keep an eye and uh, and just respond there. Uh, but we'll hand over to Glenn and uh, uh, tell us more about the course that you've run at New Life. Thanks very much. Thank, thanks, Nick. Um, that was inspiring. Uh, Latifa was 
is inspiring. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what she said about uh, Father Hart, and obviously that may be something you cover in your teaching, but I think that's where a security comes from, isn't it? Which Ian was talking about earlier. Uh, we need to grow leaders that are secured in a relationship with God their Father, uh, because if we're secure in that relationship, then um, our motives will be right, won't they? So, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, our leadership development program is really simple. Uh, like the other ones mentioned, uh, they're based on how Jesus uh, led. Uh, and the aim of our program is to develop spirit-filled leaders who are equipped and ready to lead the Jesus way in whatever context God calls them. So um, we're not specifically uh, developing leaders for church, although that does happen, but also the workplace. Um, where they're already working uh, in the community and in the neighbourhood. Um, and it's based on Jesus' example of how he led with his disciples. Uh, so we um, focus on servanthood. Uh, leadership is servanthood. So uh, it's not a pride thing. Uh, it's not something uh, necessarily to uh, build your ego. Uh, it, it's getting down and serving. So uh, we say the only place you're first in as a leader is being first in the queue to serve. Um, Jesus' method for dwelling leaders was based on friendship uh, with a mixture of teaching, prayer, and on-the-job training. So that's simply what we try to do. So we, we identify... Uh, some developing leaders in the life of the church, like Ian mentioned, we just look out for that little sign or something, a spark, and and we invite them to join a two-year uh, course. Um, we also time limit it, and uh, we're very clear about how much time will be demanded. Ian also talked about that. Uh, so it, it's two years, and uh, there's a commitment once a month, uh, and so in alternating months, uh, one month they'll spend uh, an evening with me uh, in, in our home and we just eat food, have a laugh, and we get into biblical leadership. So we look at how Jesus led uh, in the Bible and, and we focus on the, the five C's, which we try to build a leadership structure on. So uh, first of all, character. Um, that comes before everything else. Um, I've made mistakes in the past of promoting people based on their skill level, where there's no character, and that that that's always a disaster. So character comes first. We look at how Jesus did that. Uh, then charisma, the gifts, the, particularly the church building gifts, apostle, pioneering types, prophet, prophetic, uh, evangelism, uh, pastoral, and teaching. Uh, so we go through all of those and, and look at how Jesus uh, did that. Competence, uh, looking at the skills and what they're good at. You know, we expect people to be leading as they're, as they're in this programme. So, you know, helping them develop the skills. Team's been mentioned a lot tonight. So chemistry. Um, usually when you come into a team, there's a requirement on you to fit in. Uh, and you can't just come in and do your own thing. So we really work on uh, team building and what that means. And also calling. Is, is God calling them to leadership? And we think about that. So that's their time spent with me. The other month, uh, they're one-to-one -one with an existing elder leader. Uh, so we pair them up with a leader. Uh, and that leader will just meet with them, have coffee, chat, pray, uh, maybe participate in some of the things that they're doing in the life of the church. Uh, and, and go a bit deeper into some of the stuff they've been looking at uh, with me. Uh, and, and that really helps them, uh, encourages them, and it, it helps them to identify, you know, what they're good at. And, you know, just someone saying and noticing that they're good at it and saying, come on, you're really good at this. Let's give you an opportunity to do more. Uh, and then during that two-year period, they each get a, a three-month spell meeting with the existing leadership team so they come along to our meetings and they participate in the conversation uh, and and that does some really amazing because they 
they suddenly realise they've got a contribution to make uh, and their contributions valued and listened to and, and taken on board. Uh, and that just lets them see that, uh, that there is a leadership gift in there. Uh, when, they, when they meet with us for the first time, all the existing leaders come with a, a word of knowledge or a scripture just to speak into their life. And, and that has a really powerful effect right at the start of the process. And by the end of the three months, you know, hopefully they can see that um, God's at work in their life uh, and they can make a contribution uh, that's valued and, and helps uh, the church. Uh, and they're on that for a period of two years. And, and what we found is that that produces leaders in the life of our church, it produces elders, it produces ministry leaders, uh, and it also equips them to lead in our society and in our communities. Uh, uh, to make a difference. Um, it's very simple, uh, but we found it works. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, for the last few minutes, uh, an open time where anybody can ask a question of any of our uh, contributors. And, and I'd maybe, before we do that, Vicky, is there anything that you'd like to add from your experience, particularly with the Sophia Network and particular areas around raising up female leaders? Any challenges that you, you that, that either you face or you'd like to offer to us? Anything you want to say? Not really. I just ate some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> just, just only, only that I think there, are, the, there are a couple of barriers in terms of of women, and one is the church. And the treatment of women generally in the experience of women in the church um and then i think secondly is um the place of permission for women and permission given for women to to take to take those roles um and to to really look to raise up um in a appointed way um women into leadership um, and I think if we're not we're not doing that, you often find that women take the um, more backstepped roles. So they'll be happy to serve and they'll be happy to do, and but they don't really believe many of them, not all, um, that they can do it. So it's really seeking out to identify those gifts in those women, pointing them out to them, and then seeking to um, work with them and raise them up. And if we're not doing that intentionally, um, I would suggest we're missing out. That's it. Thank you. And, and it's great tonight that we've got a good mix of uh, male and female in our uh, gathering. And, and we could also add maybe as well those from, from different ethnic minorities or those with disabilities. Those are, 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 are more easily overlooked uh, and, and being more intentional, deliberate and encouraging uh, those. And younger people than, than we might normally look at as well, or maybe older people that we might normally look at. Uh, those that fall outside our kind of set box of, of, of who we draw our leaders from. Yeah, thank you. So any other questions that um, you want to make sure you get answered before you leave this session today? Otherwise you get an early finish. Kath. Can I just ask uh, Glenn, um, with with uh, the the leadership training program that you have there, um, what would be the maximum number of people that you could put through at any one time, Glenn? Because it it, it seems that you you are investing a lot of time in, in individuals, which is great and wonderful. Sounds really good, uh, but I just wonder what what your capacity is uh, for being able to to take on numbers. We we try to match numbers with the number of existing leaders. Mm. You know, so there's seven leaders at the moment, so we, we'll identify seven people to match up with one of the seven. Mm. Um, we do a bit more than that at the moment because some of our elders who've stepped back are retired, um, still willing to mentor, so we can have slightly higher capacity. Mm. But we, we try to stick with roughly the number of leaders we've got and double up. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, we were just saying in our group um, that we've 
been running. Kath, I don't know if you've heard of the CCPAS Growing Leaders course. Um, and we've been running that. We started to just, I ran that when I was in the Southeast um, and we raised leaders through that course. But we also ran it um, or started to run it just before lockdown. And then unfortunately we decided to stop and just wait until um, September this year. But that's a really great course that you can buy. It's almost off the peg, off the shelf. And you can, you can buy it and it's a 12 month, uh, or we use it as a 12 month program. Um, and you just walk alongside and work alongside those people for 12 months and um, I think anyone can present it that's the beauty of that course anyone can do it because it's off the, it's like an off the peg um, course that you can then tailor to yourself so I think that's well worth looking at and I know I think Ian you were just saying weren't you about the possibility of use, resourcing yes yes it was great to hear you mention it Vicky so it's it has all the kind of ingredients that we've been looking at tonight there's there's you know, training on all the key aspects of, of stepping into leadership, but there's also mentoring that happens. Everyone on the course has a mentor for the year who they meet with on a, on a regular basis. And at Cramno, we're thinking about um, launching that next January to serve the churches of the Northeast. We're going to have a kind of a consultation process the next couple of months just to see if that is something that people really would value, you know, we want to do things that serve the church. Um, and if, if that's positive, then we'll, we'll be opening that course up um, next year. Well, you know, we will get, be getting it started at, so in the autumn, uh, hoping people kind of join it. Um, and that'll be, you know, as Vicky said, it's, it's one day and um, 10 or nine, 10 evenings. So it's once one evening a month and one day in the year, plus time with a mentor. Uh, so it's a really, it, it, everything I've heard about the course, including now from Vicky, is this really, really helps people step into the leadership space with confidence and with vision. So I'm quite excited about it. But as I say, if you're interested in that, you want to get in touch with me, you know, send, um, Paul an email and he'll give you my email. Um, in fact, I'll put my email in the chat as well. And I've just put a, a website that gives you a link to the Growing Leaders course in, in the chat there. And I've run it with a couple of our churches uh, as well. So if you're interested in Growing Leaders, then the, the course, uh, then 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 do get in touch with me. Uh, I can put you in touch directly with Ian or... or, or um, that will work out so that you can you can get that input uh, and you've got ian's uh, email there so you can go straight to him you don't need to use me if, if that's what you'd like to do i should just clarify as well uh said in our small group that that one of the reasons behind behind having nick here today is that um it is a, a, a an impetus right across our baptist family uh, in all our regions to to develop um, apprenticeship schemes, year out schemes. We're looking to do that across our association. Uh, we may do it through hub churches that have the, the interest in doing that, or we may do one right across our region that works kind of very collectively. Uh, realistically, I don't know whether we're going to get anything up and running for this autumn, this academic year, unless you are very, very keen to be part of something uh, uh, and, and, and let me know about that. But, but hopefully over the coming few months we'll draw together one or two churches church leaders from places where there's interest to do this and we'll work out how, how it's going to work in our region but again if you feel you want to do something this coming year and and the the, the deeper discipleship course is one that might work for you then then again get in touch directly with nick uh, or naomi and I'll, I'll yeah. you get their their details so that uh, you can communicate yeah, I'll put that in. please do folks or if you know any of the other churches around you who might benefit they don't have to be baptist churches but uh, at churches who would benefit from, uh, who, who are looking for an internship kind of off the peg program, but it, it does require some um, local commitment as well to make it worthwhile. But yeah, really happy to talk that through. And ultimately, if we're working collaboratively, it can be that your church sends people into the scheme uh, and, and that you give some of your people the opportunity to, uh, uh, to grow. And you can receive people. It doesn't have to be the, the same people. So, so uh, uh, we can have giving churches and receiving churches as part of this. OK, uh, anybody else want to uh, ask a last question? And, and 
will make a, a point that is has not been said yet that we need to hear. In which case, I will invite Ian. You you'd like to mention a book that's just uh, hit the presses uh, uh, today, and, and maybe Nick, you want to mention your your book about uh, discipling young people as well. Yes. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry for being excited about this, but um, it's today's a good day for me. I, my book's launched, been published today by Hodder, and um, there it is, called To Be Friends, Unlocking the Heart of John's Gospel. And uh, I, it's the fruit of 20 years of research into the Gospel of John, but it, it's kind of landed in this really profound but exciting place that it's, it's my conviction that when we immerse people into the Gospel of John, they don't just hear the story of Jesus, they meet with Jesus and find that they've been called to be friends. And it's such a challenging idea, isn't it, that we're, we're helping people step not just into knowing about God, but knowing God and being friends of God. And the book's really all about that. It's a journey into John's gospel in order that you can deepen your friendship with Jesus or you can become friends with Jesus. And one of the exciting things that's happened today is my cousin, who has no connection with church at all, I don't think, sent me a photo of the book on a shelf in Waterstones in Nottingham and saying, "This I found this here and, and it was here until I arrived and I'm looking forward to reading it. So isn't that wonderful? And I've, I've, I've writ written it deliberately so that it's accessible to people who perhaps have very, very limited knowledge of, of faith or the Bible, but it's also interesting for people who have been Christians for, for decades. So thank you for letting me share my enthusiasm today of all days. Thank you, Paul. And, and, and if you purchase a copy and uh, make your way up to Durham, and sure Ian will sign it for you as well. And definitely. Uh, yeah, Nick, do you want to talk us about, to us about the XYZ of discipleship? Thanks, Paul. I've just quickly whipped up a picture. I haven't got a, a copy to show you, but I've got a picture, so I'll just really sh uh, share it really quickly. Um, yeah, we published, uh, my, my wife and I wrote this last year with um, support from the National Baptists Together people who helped us to, uh, with the, some of the finance of sign what it is to write a book. Uh, so this is about um, reaching uh, generations Y and Z, so people who are anything from kind of age 10 to kind of, uh, 25 that would be kind of roughly generation z these days and then the the millennials the guys who are about 23 24 up to about 39 these days so um understanding the generations under the age of 40 um how they what makes them tick some of the challenges for discipleship but also some of the opportunities um and it's got lots of up-to-date research and uh, it has some of the story of the well uh, from us as well so yeah we, we wrote it really as a resource for the uk church um i've actually sold more copies in the northeast of england i think than anywhere else so you know you could see a young adult revival uh, coming soon your way so yeah thank you paul so maybe everybody has already got their copy already if you <laughs> yeah. in our region so you don't need that one Lovely. Well, thank you all for being part of this. So thank you again to uh, to Ian and to Nick and to Glenn, uh, for, for all that you've shared with us. And, and we'll, we'll I'll add it, uh, it together and put it on our YouTube channel so we can make it available. So if you want to look at it again, if there's pieces you want to hear again, you can do. And obviously you can tell others about uh, the content tonight as well. So let me close in prayer for us uh, as we come to an end. And uh, let us remember that the same Jesus who called disciples to follow him and lived with them and sent them out on mission and let them make mistakes uh, and commissioned them and departed and then imparted the spirit, which we celebrate this, uh, this week that we're in of Pentecost. This same Jesus is always doing that throughout history and he's doing it today with our churches and with us. So Jesus, we thank you that you are in your role in the Godhead, you are the one who uh, comes amongst us. You are the one who inspires us. You call us to follow you. And through giving us your spirit, you equip us to do that. And as you call us into leadership and discipleship, you call us to make leaders and disciples of others. And so maybe as we finish this night, may, 
it might be that you would put an individual into our, each of our hearts or minds, in particular, that you want us to get alongside, maybe to mentor, maybe already in leadership that you would like us to encourage, maybe somebody who just needs a little push into uh, uh, taking on a responsibility. Jesus, Spirit, would you put people into our hearts and minds that you would call us alongside? And may you help each one of us in our different settings to follow your lead in being disciples and making disciples, in, in becoming better leaders and growing leaders, so that your kingdom may come, so that the lost may discover uh, that they are found your kingdom so that this world may be changed and transformed to be the way you would have it be we ask this in your name amen 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 lovely well lots of love to you all thanks again everybody for being part of this and uh, god's blessing be upon you as you go onwards bye for now